Welcome to Own Your Zone Podcast, where we feature venture capitalists, innovators, angels, and other investors who create positive impact globally. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi, I'm Janan Glasgow George. I'm a patent attorney and founder of Neo IP. We're a law firm that helps clients maximize return on investment for their patent assets. I'm also host of this show, Own Your Zone, where we feature venture capitalists, private equity and angel investors, and innovators. This episode is brought to you by Neo IP, where we help companies increase their valuation and protect their business through strategic IP protection. We help innovators impact society for good by transforming their ideas into valuable assets and connecting innovators to resources they need to make that impact. Today on our show, I'm so delighted to have John Hagel, a futurist, a well-regarded and trusted advisor, uh, published uh, widely, an amazing speaker. You've done TEDx, TED Talks. Um, welcome so much. You are founder of Beyond Our Edge. John Hagel, welcome to Own Your Zone. Thank you very much. What an amazing background you have. You have uh, a JD um, and MBA from Harvard uh, University. You are at Oxford University. Um, you have a degree also um, from Wesleyan University. So you're, you've got the <laughs> degrees for sure. But you're more than studying uh, things of past. You are looking into the future. So let's talk a little bit about what got you into futurism? Talk about what is that and why that captivates you so much. Yeah, well, it's it's challenging at one level because I, I actually started as a very young child I, with um, a fascination with science fiction. And so it was all about the future and what the future holds. Um, I, I will say many people use the term futurism or futurist and the, it goes back to the early 20th century in Italy, where it was an art movement, a uh, futurist art movement. Um, today, it's much more just focused on what can we learn about the future and how can it help us in terms of having more impact today. And so that's really my focus is really trying to look at the long term trends that are shaping the future. and. Um, based on that trying to anticipate what are some emerging opportunities um, that could be addressed and part of my my goal is to motivate people to address the future not just uh, you know see it in the future but uh, really take action and uh, and achieve impact from from those opportunities so Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I, I love that. I mean, a lot of the work we do with intellectual property is for the future. It's inventions that need to be brought as solutions into the world. So we love looking at patterns and patent data uh, because it shows us where investment has been. What kind of patterns are you looking at as you are projecting ahead into the future? What data sets do you look at? Well, it's sometimes data sets, but I mean, certainly I think I've been in Silicon Valley now for over 40 years, so um, I, I'm definitely uh, paying a lot of attention to digital technology and the exponential price performance improvement of digital technology, which I think is a key key driver. Um, I think the other trends have to do with um, the people and, and their emotions. It's something that I just wrote a book about, but uh, I think we're we're seeing a, a world of increasing fear, and um, there's a need, I believe, to cultivate emotions that will help us to move beyond the fear and really address the opportunities. So there are there are a lot of trends that um, are playing out. They, another one, which is a bit uneven right now, is a growing connectivity around the world, but um, partly through public policy, partly through technology infrastructure, we're much more connected in ways that, you know, would have been unimaginable um, two, two or three decades ago. So a lot of, a lot of trends. 
I love how the connectivity enables collaboration that wasn't possible, um, you know, just maybe even a few years ago. You've talked yeah. before. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I was just going to say that there, there, I love paradox. And one of the paradoxes that I'm seeing is that at the same time, we have increasing connectivity around the world. Uh, we have increasing fear, and that's limiting our collaboration. Um, we are much less inclined to collaborate because we our trust is eroding and everybody else. And so uh, we're not taking harnessing the full potential of that connectivity. That's a that's a really sobering point for sure. Um, <laughs> As I have been traveling um, internationally, and travel is not what it used to be, but it is so easy to maintain that contact and connection. But you're right to take action on it. We've got to trust people, um, maybe whom we haven't met before, uh, for sure. I, I love the sharing of ideas, but we find a lot of times inventors can be a little fearful of sharing their ideas for fear of them being stolen or lost. And yet you have to share them to act on them. Right. Um, so super important. You've talked a lot about the big shift. Um, and I, I find that to be pretty interesting. Um, we're in an exponential world, as you describe it. And you have a company to help encourage business leaders to think beyond boundaries. Talk a little bit about the big shift idea. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's been a centerpiece of my research for decades now. Um, I've come to believe that because of the long-term trends that are playing out, we're um, seeing a fundamental transformation in our global economy and society. And yet all our institutions and activities tend to be geared to the past, the way we operated in the past. And um, part of the big shift, again, I love paradox, but Part of the big shift is that it's creating mounting performance pressure on all of us. So at one level, um, intensifying competition on a global scale. Trade barriers and ability to ship products is increasing. So we're competing around the world in a more and more intense way. The pace of change is accelerating. So things we thought we could count on are no longer there. and. Um, because of all the connectivity, a small event somewhere in the world cascades quickly into an extreme disruptive event and leaves us scrambling to figure out what to do. There I mentioned pandemic as <laughs> just one example of an extreme disruptive event. Any one of those would, alone would be a lot of pressure. The three together um, creates enormous pressure. And I think ultimately, and my view is that's what's driving the emotion of fear that we're experiencing in the world. But the um, the flip side, and again, it's a paradox, but in the big shift, what we're seeing is exponentially expanding opportunity. Yeah. We can create far more value with far less resource, far more quickly than would have been imaginable a few decades ago. But if you're driven by fear, you can't even see those opportunities, much less have the motivation to pursue them. So I think, again, the, the early impact of the big shift is creating that fear and tightening down and holding on to what we have versus really seeing the opportunities and pursuing them. We work a lot with entrepreneurs and serial entrepreneurs um, who are innovating and some of the work that I've done in the past with the UN Economic Commission for Europe, the data showed pretty clearly that the number one way to improve quality of life for citizens in any country is entrepreneurship and innovation, bringing the disruption, bringing the future into reality, creating jobs, creating wealth, and bringing these solutions into the earth. So. I'm uh, always an optimist, I guess, and <laughs> we, are, we are watching a lot of trends, it, as you mentioned, digitization, that seem to be pretty fascinating, um, like the digital twinning uh, areas, a lot of investment, a lot of useful application, industrial, and even into entertainment and metaverse. 
what what are your thoughts on some of these solutions being accelerated into the planet what i know you've talked about water and other areas um what are your thoughts there in terms of solutions or opportunities opportunities yeah. probably always invite solutions right uh all patents are inventive solutions to problems so i guess i always think of the problem and the flip side is that opportunity to bring a solution that then can have economic impact what are your thoughts there well i guess my first reaction is to want to flip that because i am an optimist too and i believe we are too focused on problems and the terrible things happening in the world you know we're all going to die um terrible things happening everywhere in the world those are the problems we need to find solutions i believe there are huge opportunities to create value in ways that would have never been possible before and help everyone in the world progress and not just the people, but the plants and the animals and to flourish. Um, and yes, there are, there are barriers and obstacles that are standing in our way of addressing those opportunities. Those are the problems, but we need to motivate people with the excitement about the opportunity. What could we accomplish if we all came together? And this is a key theme in my new book, um, The Journey Beyond Fear. But it's um, a view that uh, we are increasingly dominated by threat-based narratives around the world, all about the enemies coming to get us. We're all going to die. Uh, we need to mobilize now and resist. And um, I, oh boy, I'm sorry. Just did something here. My computer. Um, hopefully, that. technology can be challenging as well as an opportunity for sure. But uh, no, so I think that it's a notion of um, really in, with exciting people about um, opportunity based narratives. What could we accomplish if we all came together? And I think that's that's largely missing. <clears throat> and it will be a, a key to unleashing all the entrepreneurship. And um, I, I'm sorry, I'll just go on for one more minute. They um, I mentioned I've been in Silicon Valley now for over 40 years, and um, <clears throat> people ask me all the time, "What do you? Uh, how do you attribute the success of Silicon Valley over so many decades?" And you know, most people would refer to the universities, the venture capital firms, you know. The, infrastructure and i believe the real success of silicon valley is an opportunity based narrative it was this the view that we're, we're coming into a, a world of exponential technology digital technology that can change the world but for the better but if you want to if if this is going to happen you need to come to silicon valley will you come to silicon valley and it's why the majority of successful entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley were not born in the United States, much mm -hmm. less Silicon Valley. because so they were so inspired and excited by this opportunity. They came from all over the world. So I think it's a very powerful motivator and really can unleash the entrepreneurship and the innovation that we need. Yeah, that's inspiring. I, I, I guess I would... Um you know, sort of echo that the, the attraction of Silicon Valley was globally magnetic. It was drawing people mm -hmm. in from everywhere. It was very um, acceptable to come from everywhere. We've uh, had a past guest, uh, Silvina Moschini, who's uh, originally from Argentina, and she wasn't so welcome there initially as a, a, a woman from Latin America and yet became a unicorn. So I think that we are beginning to see more and more, I will say like unicorn, high success entrepreneurs coming from anywhere today, um, that it's not a requirement maybe to go to Silicon Valley, but bring that attitude that, you know, creating those opportunity zones, if you will, wherever you are. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I tend to be a bit uh, perhaps biased by my history in Silicon Valley, but I've come to believe that um, 
connecting people in one place can create much greater innovation and, and breakthroughs than you can if you're just isolated in a small community somewhere, even if you have great imagination or whatever. Um, people from diverse backgrounds coming together can unleash even more innovation and entrepreneurship. But there was an interesting um, book, and I'm unfortunately going to blank on the name of the woman. She's a professor at uh, Berkeley who um, did a historical examination back in the 1970s and early 60s. Um, there were two tech centers in the United States. There was Route 128 around Boston, and then there was Silicon Valley. And over over the decades, Route 128 kind of receded uh, into more of the margin. Silicon Valley became more and more of a center. And she said, "Why? Why? Why did that happen?" And her her analysis was the culture in those two areas. In Route 128, if you were a techie, you joined a, a tech company, and you were there for life. Huh. That was your career. And when you got together for parties or gatherings, social gatherings, it was people from your company. So it was very contained, self-contained, even though there was a large, much larger community out there. In Silicon Valley, the culture was if you're with a company for more than two years, there's something wrong with you. You, know, you lack <laughs> ambition, you lack uh, bravery or whatever. And so um, people were constantly rotating across companies. And the social gatherings were gatherings of people from many different companies who would start talking about problems they were addressing and you know, looking for ideas and suggestions on how to uh, resolve it. And so her view was that really stimulated a much greater degree of innovation and entrepreneurship than the silos of Route 128. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I'm... Uh, conducting this interview from Durham, North Carolina, and the Research Triangle Park itself about 60 years ago was formed to, first of all, prevent the brain drain from all the university graduates leaving to find jobs. And uh, you probably know the story. It was about $1 million that was pulled together from people all over the state, business leaders, executives, banks, et cetera. And they acquired the contiguous property in Research Triangle Park and set up RTI International as a research organization that's now doing almost two billion a year, I think, in funded research. But it is a very diverse area and yet not Silicon Valley. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's important for areas to find their own identity and be authentic. It is a here a very collaborative environment and some would say um maybe more collaborative than competitive um silicon valley is known as being competitive what are your thoughts on that sort of collaboration compared with competition yeah and i, I like most things in life i've come to view the, view life as a, a question of balance it's not either or um and I think in Silicon Valley, there there is certainly a competitive culture and ethics. But but again, there are people sitting in bars and nightclubs talking about confidential information of their company <laughs> and asking for help, you know, because they 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 can't figure out how to address this. And so they're they're looking for collaboration. They're looking for people to connect. And um I think it's, again, a, a, an interesting balance that has to be achieved. If you're For just sure. competitive or if you're just collaborative, good luck. It's not going to work. I know you've talked about the future of work, and we're seeing a lot of the big tech companies not requiring people to come back to work after the pandemic. And yet being in one place does kind of ignite the magic uh, of innovation and creativity, being able to just bounce ideas off of someone in real time in person. There's an energy, I think, to that. Um, mm. Talk a little bit about your point of view on the future of work, not hybridized or all remote, but like, are people coming back together? Uh, eventually, I wouldn't <laughs> say they're coming. I mean, there's some 
coming together. More and more companies are now saying, well, two or three days a week, you have to come into the office and a couple of days you can be out at, at, at home or wherever. But, um, but I, I do believe, you know, again, it goes back to the big shift kind of context and perspective in a rapidly changing world, an increasingly competitive world, um, we need to be constantly innovating. It's not just something that you do in an innovation lab or a research center. You do it throughout the organization, in all departments. You have to be coming up with creative approaches to unforeseen situations and problems that you're addressing. And I believe to do that, no matter how smart or intelligent you are as, as a first individual, you're going to come up with a lot better answers, more effective answers, if you come together into small groups. And this is based on research that I've done. I call them impact groups, but it's typically anywhere between three to 15 people who are form deep trust-based relationships with each other. And on the one side are constantly challenging each other, saying, how can we get to even better um, impact or more impact? And then on the other side, supporting each other when things don't work out, not to worry, we're going to keep going. And um, It's those impact groups and it's the physical connection. It's not just being on Zoom or, you know, uh, on the phone. It's seeing the entire person and, and understanding who, who these people are and how to build true trust-based relationships with them. And that has to happen in person. It's not going to happen uh working remotely so i don't know it's a good point that's a really good point um if we think also about the future of work we are noticing a lot on rethinking education re-educating um i am ip expert in residence at high point university where they talk about preparing students for uh the work that will be not the jobs that are there today those yeah. things that are yet to be i mean we're noticing this with uh prompt writing for uh stimulating generative ai for example um but upskilling and reskilling there's a an interesting group called gleek in dubai that's doing micro upskilling sessions that's kind of fascinating what what do you what are you seeing about just sort of lifelong learning and and yeah. reskilling re reeducating or continuously educating wow how many hours do we have here i don't know it's a, <laughs> yeah. it's been a key key theme in my research for sure again because of accelerating pace of change uh we need to learn faster um uh, throughout our lives so yes lifelong learning at one level but the challenge is what do you mean by learning and um when I talk to executives and leaders, invariably, when I talk about learning, they say, oh, training programs. Uh -huh. We have training programs. Yes, we do learning. But that's sharing existing knowledge versus how do you learn by creating entirely new knowledge that never existed before? That's the most powerful and necessary form of learning that we all need to do. And how is that done? That's not done in a training room. That's done in the workplace, yeah. coming together, addressing unexpected situations, problems, opportunities, and finding ways to uh, to create value and impact from them. And again, I'm sorry, you just triggered me on this. Two things. One is lifelong learning. Great. Um, I will ask executives when I hear that term, which has become a buzzword now, well, what's the motivation for lifelong learning? You know, that requires a huge amount of effort and you know, a lot of risk. And why would you do that? And the answer invariably that I get is, well, if you don't, you're going to lose your job. The fear. Fear. <laughs> you know, that's the motivation. And my belief is, well, fear can drive some learning. The most powerful, effective form of learning comes from excitement and passion around the, the area you're addressing. Curiosity. Curiosity, and and so that raises the other point, which is um, reskilling. <laughs> Again, when people talk about learning, they're talking in the corporate world. They're talking well, in large institutions. They're talking about um, helping individuals acquire new skills that are going to be necessary in their in their work. 
And while I don't want to dismiss that, I, I make a distinction. It's not necessarily one that everyone makes, but for me, skills are valuable in a specific context. You know, if I'm writing this form of code or if I'm uh, operating this kind of machine, that's the skill that I need to be able to do that successfully. But it's useless anywhere else. I mean, if it's a different machine or a different, you know, yeah. thing, that skill is not going to be helpful. I focus on in the future work on cultivating what I call capabilities, not skills. And capabilities, the distinction for me is capabilities are valuable in every context, not just the one or two specific contexts. And the capabilities, I mean, there are many we could talk about, but I talk about curiosity, imagination, creativity, uh, connection, ability to connect with others. Those are valuable in whatever environment you're in. Yes. But, <laughs> again, I'm sorry I'm ranting a bit, but um, my belief is in every large institution today, those capabilities are deeply suspect. Unless you're in the research lab or innovation center somewhere, but if you're in any other department in the organization, read the process manual. Mm -hmm. Do the tasks as written, as assigned. Do not deviate. And don't ask too many questions <laughs> because that's a distraction. Just follow the manual. And it's the reason I think our education system has yeah. been built around squashing curiosity, imagination, creativity. Listen to the teacher, memorize what the teacher has to say, and then show you memorized it on the exam. That's the key to success. It was preparing us for the large institutions we have around the world. So I'm sorry, I've ranted a bit here, but... Uh, no, that's kind of fascinating. I, I, That's one reason I think that we are hearing more and more about the value of having an entrepreneurial mindset, this idea of like, we can do it. We'll find a way. Is there a better way to do it? Is there a way to improve on it? Why? Just asking the question, why? Why is it done this way? Help me understand uh, what's going on there. And then maybe breaking the rules a little bit, or at least bending yeah. them. <laughs> no, well, again, I'll just be a bit of a uh, um, contrarian and a, a focus on leadership. Um, in, in today's large institutions, and I'm going to generalize, I know there are exceptions, but in large institutions today, the mark of a strong leader is someone who has an answer to all the questions. No matter what the question is, you can count on the leader to have an answer. And by the way, if they don't have an answer, maybe it's time to get rid of them and find somebody who does. Oh. And it's the reason why I believe, you know, again, we talk about it all the time, uh, trust is eroding in all institutions around the world. Everybody knows that. Everybody's seen the surveys. When I ask the question, why? I get kind of a puzzled look. I'm not sure. I believe it's because we have that form of leader who has the answer to all questions. There are two possibilities. One is they either have no clue how rapidly the world is changing and how many new things are going on, or they're lying. In either case, why would I trust them? Either one's good. As leaders. And so, I believe the mark of a strong leader, and this builds on your comment, um, the mark of a strong leader in the future is the one who has the most powerful questions. Yes. Who will ask a really inspiring question and ask for help. Say, I don't have an answer. I need help. Can you help? This would be remarkable if we could come up with an answer. And that drives learning and collaboration, and curiosity and all these other capabilities that are missing in most large institutions today. Amen to that. I'm, <laughs> I'm for that for sure. Um, let's shift on to a topic of the day that um, for many does uh, have opportunity and for many more, we're hearing fearful comments and that's uh, artificial intelligence, AI, um, and maybe uh, uh, the the fear of it needs to be regulated, the fear of the people losing jobs because of AI. And yet it seems that there is a lot of opportunity for deployment of AI to improve the world, to provide solutions faster, to 
expedite uh, things that would take longer for humans to do. And uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on AI and generative AI in particular. Regulation, uh, not regulate. Control, release. What do you think? Yeah, uh, and again, it would require a long time to go into depth on this. But um, one thing that I'm concerned about is when I talk to leaders, and again, I'm going to generalize, but when I talk to leaders about AI, I get two questions. Um, how fast can I automate? And how many jobs can I eliminate? It's all about cutting costs, cutting people out. I believe, and I've given talks on this, that uh, artificial intelligence and, and technology in general can restore our humanity. Because now AI can take over all the standardized routine tasks yeah. that we have been assigned to do in the process manual, which we as humans were never really designed to do. I mean, we get distracted, we make mistakes, we get bored. AI can do all that. Let them take the tasks, the routine tasks that today define our work. And now let's take the people and rather than firing them, let's redefine the work that they do yeah. and say, your job is to address unseen problems and opportunities that can create far more value for us. And again, this is not just in a research lab or innovation center. This is in every department of a large institution. What are the unseen problems and opportunities that can create more value for our stakeholders? Huge potential for innovation and entrepreneurship to flourish throughout the organization, rather than just uh, being small silo on the side of the organization. Sure. It's the freedom to um, explore, the freedom to imagine, the freedom to think, to yeah. stop and think. Yeah. And be, cu be curious, ask a lot of questions. I mean, that's uh, the mark to me of a, of a powerful learner, is somebody who has really interesting questions and keeps coming up with new questions. He's never satisfied with the answers that. Uh, what they come up with. As we were talking about lifelong learning, I think it does sort of merge in here how we're raising the next generation through the university system. Doesn't seem that maybe four years is the right number. That's okay. so arbitrary. It's four years. Yeah. It's we can accelerate some of the core learning, and then there's the new. There's so much more that is uh, it's not in a textbook because that takes time to put it in the book, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it seems to me that having more experiential learning, exploratory learning, um, that's not confined to, you know, the four years of two semesters per year. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on that? No, well, I think it's <clears throat> essential for our progress and success to rethink at a fundamental level our all our institutions, our you know, every educational institutions, our businesses. Um, but to me, the key question is, how do we cultivate capabilities rather than skills? Because in a rapidly changing world, that's what's going to be most valuable and necessary. And um, how do we um, cultivate the emotions that will want motivate people to cultivate those skills? So again, if you're living in a world of fear, if you're driven by fear, you don't want to be curious. You don't want to ask questions. That's you know scary. It uh, shows you're a weakling. You don't have the answers. Um, versus if you're really excited about having more and more impact in a certain area, and I've come to call the, the excitement the passion of the explorer. But I, if you have the passion to explore, you are driven to ask questions. You're driven to imagine potential answers. You're driven to be creative about how to actually act on those ideas so to me that's what we really need to focus on I, yeah. you know i i challenge how many large institutions do you know that actually measure the passion of their workers nobody yeah and i i actually did a survey of the entire u.s workforce and at most uh 14 percent one four percent of the workers have this form of passion about their work. Oh, 
And I'm actually amazed that they that there are that many people because again, I believe we have institutions that seek to crush that passion. If you have passion, do it as a hobby at, at home or you know, after work. But when you're in the office, just follow the manual. Do the assigned tasks. I do think you're right. And I think it's hard to be creative without joy, have some, having some enthusiasm and just a, I think a I do think joy is a sort of foundation for being able to create. But um, we work with intellectual property data a lot. And one of the things that excites me about it is that it gives anyone really the ability to explore any area. What have been all of the creative solutions over time? If you want to look at um, water treatment and purification, what's been done and it leads up to and what next and what next? could be financial technology or um, again, digital twinning, edge computing, or even it can be um, educational methodologies. Uh, it's a fascinating place, I think, to explore. And you not only find the these solutions, but one thing that I think is fascinating is that they all originate with people that People are inventive. The human being is what is at the core, the base of, or, or the starting point of all ideas. And I believe that God does give us all this unlimited resource of ideas. But then we have to take action on them, explore them, put some effort into them, try to create the prototype, and uh, and then try to scale and bringing others in in where we don't have expertise. There's always a person connected to a patent. Um, so it's a good way even in today's connected society to reach out. I encourage students to do that quite a lot as well. Um, what are your thoughts on intellectual property? And and I'm sure you've run into patents and, and inventions as you've uh, had such a storied career. Yeah, no, I, I think patents have, have enormous value in terms of protecting um, the knowledge and ideas that have been generated, I I do worry about the mindset. I, I call it the static knowledge mindset, which is, you know, often if you come up with a great new patent, you know, idea and patent it, um, job done. Oh. We're, we're, we're going to be successful now. And we need to protect that knowledge from anybody else versus, no, a dynamic view of knowledge that this is just the beginning. There's so much more to be learned, and how can we collaborate? You know, in an environment where the IP is protected, so there, you know, we're not going to lose the, the uh, knowledge we already have or protection of knowledge, but we're going to be continually searching to create new knowledge and patent that over time. But I think again, it's that dynamic view yeah. of this is a continuing process versus you know just something to exactly exactly. Well, it's, it's been such a joy to have you on the show. As we're closing out, um, why don't you share one thing that excites you and maybe one thing that scares you about the future? <laughs> Boy, uh, I mean, what, uh, definitely I'm excited about digital technology and the exponential opportunities. If I had to single out a particular area in digital technology, I would talk about uh, biosynthesis. And the opportunity for technology to extend our lives and our wellness, not just we live longer, but we live much healthier lives and longer term lives. Uh, I think we're just at the very beginning of the potential for that. And um, what scares me is the the emotion of fear that I think is um, holding us back from really being even more effective in, in addressing the opportunities that are out there. Well, we're excited about your new book. And how can our listeners find you online and find your book? Great. Well, uh, I have a website, johnhagel.com. And uh, the book is available certainly through Amazon or other bookstores. It's published by a major publisher, McGraw-Hill. And um, I'm active on social media. So LinkedIn, uh, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook are all areas that I'm active on. and I. Constantly, I'm sharing things that I've seen and learned that I think can be helpful to others. So, 
Well, thank you for connecting with us today. And we look forward to hearing all of the material that you're sharing online and on social media. And thanks again for joining us, John. John Hagel. Thank you very much for your interest. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Own Your Zone podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.